All right, so moving on again, I've got these kind of anatomically arranged. And so we'll start with this subdural abscess. So this is an intracranial subdural. You can see there was a fluid collection in the right frontal region, there are a few, and there's even one that's uh, parafalsine up high right there. In addition, the cisterns are gone. The paramescent phallic cisterns are just effaced. Look at that brainstem. So this is definitely something that could have been called. And as you can see, no acute findings uh, was the reading here. And it got a 10 out of 10 for being a good report. So this patient came in, as you can see, migraine, sudden onset, weakness, and numbness to the left lower extremity. So they did pursue it and they did a CTA. And you can see not only those fluid collections and the problems we previously discussed, but there's also even superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. So there again are the paramescent cephalic cisterns, which are essentially absent. We've got enhancing uh, subdural fluid collections in the right frontal region and parafalsine. And then again, there is actually thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus with a filling defect that you can see right there. So this was read as multiple chronic appearing extraaxial subdural fluid collections. This is an acute presentation with neurologic deficits. And, oh, actually, if you look up at the clinical history, it says, question dense lesion, right subdural into Sylvian fissure with edema, rule out subdural. That was a neurologist that was consulted on this, came in and looked at the initial CT and saw what our radiologist had not, and even put it in the clinical history when ordering the CTA. So it was there. We only dinged this one on structured reporting. So this patient came in, presented with headache, left hemiparesis, and confusion. The CT, an hour later, was read as sinus disease. CTA described fluid, but downplayed it. In spite of edema, rule out subdural as the history. Transfer to repeat CT demonstrated the subdural abscess. Recurrent infections, multiple craniotomies ensued. The patient now has left hemiplegia and cognitive impairment. So the estimated verdict was high. This was a young patient, 7 to 15 million, chance of success 30, because we missed on two CTs. A portion liability was 40, and the estimated settlement 1.25 million. So we came in close to 900,000, not so far off. Uh, the neurologist correctly interpreted the CT and ordered a CTA with a clear and informative clinical history uh, to no avail. Uh, the radiologist reads, probably can't be defended as they failed to relay any suggestion of an acute process in the plaintiff's brain. The plaintiff will garner sympathy from the jury as he was a working student in his early 20s whose wife gave birth to a child shortly after these events. The fact that he continued to work and is attempting to go back to school will engender further sympathy since he will not be seen as a malingerer. Pretty interesting. This last one I find really interesting, though. We have surveillance of the plaintiff driving, using both hands, and appearing fine in public. We have a photograph of the plaintiff using his left arm and hand to hold the newborn child. We will also show the plaintiff was a below average student anyway before the injury and still has an average IQ. What a sleaze. Uh, I mean, this is the kind, of, but this is the kind of stuff they're doing in your defense, right? And it it is impressive. They actually will put private eyes on people. They will certainly go into all your social media and produce all kinds of Facebook pictures of you traveling and having fun and clearly not uh, suffering terribly from your incurred disability. So it uh, it is a very common thing to see in these deposition records that this sort of thing goes on. All right, this one, well, it's just not that exciting. I think everybody uh, can see it. Well, the red circle does help, but it is obviously just a hyperdense MCA that was missed. Really not a lot of ischemic change, nothing I would call uh, in that right hemisphere, but all the same, a pretty clear dense MCA, not one that's uh, you know, really very questionable. It's clearly asymmetric and it's a long segment. You can track and see that it clearly is within the vessel. 
So we got a 10 out of 10 on this one, uh, obviously not for accuracy, but uh, it was a nice structured report that addressed the clinical concern and on and on. 6 p.m. presentation with collapse and a Glasgow coma scale of five. The head CT was read as normal. The final read did describe the dense MCA at 8 a.m. the next morning. A repeat CT showed a large right MCA infarct, and the patient now has dense hemiplegia, and as you could see, was really pretty young. So an estimated verdict was 5 million, chance of success 40, apportioned liability 65, so we got about two thirds of it. An estimated settlement came in at 845, and we got away for basically a million dollars. The, the majority of these estimated verdicts, I would say, were probably within about 10 or 20 percent. Uh, but there were probably 30% that were wildly off. When I went and I, I made columns of the estimates and the actual payouts and saw that it's probably about 60 or 70% are in the ballpark. Uh, the defense, uh, the defenses to the allegations against the co-defendant, emergency room physicians in the hospital, will be that the plaintiff's care was driven by the radiologist interpretation of the CT scan. Again, not unreasonable. Uh, if it had been read as an acute stroke, then uh, the ER physician would have acted accordingly. But it, the ER physician failed to recognize acute stroke, failed to obtain and communicate a full clinical history, <laughs> that's one of the few times that comes up, and failed to perform an adequate neurological exam. So that's why they, uh, they too were included in here. Uh, lastly, the plaintiff was employed during office work, uh, doing office work in the body shop at Chrysler. She earned $10 an hour and worked 40 hours a week. In 2010, the plaintiff stopped working to care for her mother and returned to work in 2014. Her W-2 for 2014 was $7,600 and for 2015 was $16,200. Those are the kinds of evaluations that go into these, uh, into these settlements. All right, this one is a missed pneumothorax. This is the only one that, uh, that is a pneumothorax and one of the chest X-ray cases that we had, but this one, it was actually not a big payout. So as you can see, the indemnity was only 59,000. So we read it as normal. There clearly is a fairly sizable pneumothorax on the right there. Got an eight out of 10 dinged for structured reporting and a lack of pertinent negatives. So this patient came in with shortness of breath and chest pain. Chest x-ray was interpreted as normal and she was discharged without treatment. Came back a long time later, five or six weeks uh, with shortness of breath and there was a complete right pneumothorax at that point. Other than a prof professed inability to run, the patient has resumed all normal activities. Initial demand was 400,000. Uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the damages was the issue here. They couldn't really prove that uh, there was any persistent disability from this. Chance of success was given at 60, and the apportioned liability all went to the radiologist. Fairly unusual, I think only five, maybe six of these total uh, cases were 100% apportioned liability which actually strikes me as funny because I think in a lot of these, you could say, hey, I was relying on that exam. If I had the clinician ordered the appropriate exam and got back a normal read, you know, that seems to be pretty defensible. So the estimated settlement was 225, but this patient wasn't much of an earner. Uh, the Bronx County jury pool is notoriously sympathetic to plaintiffs and find it difficult to follow complicated causation art arguments. Mm -hmm. Or Bronx. Alex, are you in the Bronx? No, you're Brooklyn. Okay. <laughs> uh, juries in this county tend to award the largest verdicts in the state. The plaintiff firm is small and aggressive and is known for taking weak, low yield cases for settlement. Uh, the patient plaintiff has a history of heavy smoking, drug use, and prison time for forgery and had multiple prior pneumothoraces. Kind of funny, you wonder uh, how she didn't bring that up and maybe ask people to take a second look. Huh? All right, this is the only case of PE on the entire list and it's really small stuff. Now, I do occasionally hear people talk about, uh, well, these tiny PEs, 
clinicians don't want us to call them in. They get mad when we do. People are concerned that AI is finding these tiny PEs that don't really matter. That's not true. I would recommend that you push back on anyone that says a tiny PE doesn't matter because we're not diagnosing PE for the sake of uh, hemodynamic consequences, right? Or emergent management. When you diagnose PE, the whole point is that you are establishing that patient has a source for thromboembolism. And if they just had a tiny one, well, that's lucky for everybody because now you know it's there and can anticoagulate that patient. That's the basic premise for the treatment of pulmonary embolism. And you'll hear it from radiologists, you'll hear it from clinicians that that's a tiny PE. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, anticoagulate the patient. They've got a source somewhere and the next one's going to be the big one that kills them. So you hear that cited all the time, and I think it's very it's very much analogous to the situation of the tiny intracranial hemorrhage. Oh, that's not doing anything. What's the problem? It changes the management, right? Enormously so, especially in a stroke patient, right? So uh, I think it's important that we we report these tiny things, and this is a great example of that fact. These are tiny little pulmonary emboli. I honestly, when I first opened this one up, I said, well, what are we talking about here? <laughs> I mean, they are really hard to find. But ultimately, I circled a few of them. There are some very small peripheral PEs present. And the radiologist in reviewing it later said, yeah, I do see them. So this one got a 10 out of 10 for being a good report. Presented to the ER with shortness of breath. There was an elevated D-dimer. The CT was read as normal. The patient returned to the ER by ambulance after collapse nine days later and was dead. The autopsy showed large bilateral pulmonary emboli. So there is my stance on the small pulmonary embolism. Uh, estimated verdict of 1.25 million, chance of success 20. A portion liability was 80 and the estimated settlement 200,000, which we came in very close to. So again, an older patient that definitely mitigates the uh, damages that are incurred. <laughs> older than I am. <laughs> so this was interesting in that Indiana has a panel where this is presented to a panel of physicians that decide whether this is a legitimate case. And actually, uh, as I am licensed in 50 states, I have served on a few of these panels and Montana keeps asking me back. Uh, but I have to say, these panels are neat. I think it's a great way to go about these med mal cases. Uh, essentially, it's like a mini court. And so I'm part of a panel in Montana that it, they have me, they have another uh, local radiologist, they have another practitioner in a different specialty, they have a court, uh, they have um, a lawyer that's appointed by the state who sits on the panel with us, and then they have a representative of the general population that's governor appointed. And so we sit, I think it's a panel of four or five people, and we hear the presentations from the council, from both the plaintiff and the defendant, and they essentially have a mini trial for us. They even uh, produce documents and let us review uh, evidence exhibits. And ultimately, we're able to just vote and say, this is a legitimate case that should go to trial and be further investigated, or we can dismiss it out of hand. And I think it's a great way to go about it. And Indiana is one of those that has this. They also uh, make anyone practicing in Indiana actually contribute to a fund, right? So that if there is a terrible outcome and someone is underinsured and incapable of paying an indemnity, it actually comes out of that state fund. All right, the patient compensation fund, that was that last comment there. <laughs> 